Hey everybody, it's Lon Seibin. We're back with another interview this week because uh, we sent somebody to Utah to watch a rocket booster that was strapped to the ground, uh, get launched essentially in a test flight. It didn't go anywhere, it was just uh, staying put, but it was basically simulating its full uh, ride to orbit. And uh, Derek DeVille is joining us, who was the guy we sent over there. And uh, Derek is a solid rocket enthusiast. He is a hobbyist who makes rockets that go all the way off into space, so we figured he'd be the, the best guy to send to Utah to check this out. So first of all, Derek, uh, welcome to the show. Uh, why should we care about what happened in Utah this week? What was the big deal? Uh, this was a, a full duration qualification motor test of the uh, Space Launch System boosters. So the replacement system that NASA is planning to use uh, to replace the shuttle is called the Space Launch System. And it utilizes a lot of the same components that were used in the space shuttle, uh, in particular the solid rocket boosters. Uh, the main difference made out of four segments, these are made out of five segments. So they took the same existing segments, they have a, a, a forward segment and an aft segment that are uh, specifically configured for those, those areas, and then they normally have two center segments, now they're placing a third center segment. Uh, and with that, they have a total of 1.5 million pounds of propellant in these now. Wow. Uh, these are the biggest solid boosters there are. Uh, and they produce the, about 3.6 million pounds of thrust at peak thrust. So we're playing uh, a simulated video, minutes. right? And we're playing a simulated video of this right now, so you can't see it on your end, but it's, uh, these, are, these are the two rockets that are attached to the side of this enormous rocket going up on the screen right now. So this is more powerful than the Apollo? Rockets? Yeah, so uh, the, the plan for the space launch system uh, would be for these two boosters, which have three and a half million pounds of thrust each, and then four of the what used to be the space shuttle main engine, now they're considered the Rocketdyne RS-25, uh, uh, to attach to the central core. Uh, and combined, those will produce nine million pounds of thrust, which is, uh, exceeds the 7.7 .7 million pounds of thrust of the Apollo Saturn V uh, rockets. So this, this, when they do launch, it will be the biggest rocket ever. And, and solid rocket boosters are not like um, a jet engine. So what happens when you light it? Is there any way you can stop it? Yeah, so solid rockets uh, burn kind of like a candle, but uh, very quickly. So they contain their own oxidizer and fuel in one mix, uh, and they burn on the surface. And as they burn, they continuously burn, and there's no way to put it out. So once you start it, you're, you're on for the ride. And these burn for a little over two minutes. So it's a, it's a big commitment once you light these things. And, and really speaks to the, how brave these astronauts are for getting in these <laughs> space shuttles, that you had no way out of it, and, and when that thing lit, you had to just ride it until it was out. Yeah, there's, there's no, no changing anything. Once you press the button on these, you're committed. Wow. Uh, and one, of the, one of the neat little uh, side tidbits is that uh, when, when they used the space shuttle, uh, in the space shuttle configuration, the solid rocket boosters were strapped to the launch pad because the, the, the shuttle orbiter had the main engines on it, and it actually provide, uh, had, had a little bit of a lateral thrust component to it. So they needed to hold everything down until they got everything lined up just right. It was called a twang. Uh, in the SLS system, they're going to eliminate those bolts, and that the rocket will just be standing freestanding vertical on the pad uh, with nothing holding it down and it'll be able to pull away and that's one of the ways that they're reducing the risk associated with the launch uh, with the SLS system. And I guess they're not going to keep these solid rocket boosters throughout the, the lifespan of this rocket system, right? Eventually they're going to change these into something else? Yeah, so what, what they've done, uh, NASA's got a really neat plan here. They're taking the legacy hardware from the space shuttle program and these are the same components that were used and reused, and they were reusable when it was in the space shuttle program. So the boosters would jettison from the, from the external tank core uh, uh, in the shuttle. They would pop out parachutes, they would land in the ocean, and they'd pull them back and reprocess them. The plan now for the SLS is they won't be doing that reprocessing. Uh, they'll just let them fall into the ocean and become artificial reefs. But because of all the boosters that they've collected and used throughout the shuttle program, they have enough hardware now to do eight of these SLS missions with the existing hardware before they run out of hardware. And the idea is during that time, while they're using those eight boosters and going through those initial missions, they're gonna be developing what they're calling the advanced booster, which will likely use a composite case uh, and run at a higher pressure and be a higher performance motor uh, than what they're using now. But this is a, a quick bridge that lets them get into flight much sooner. 
Wow, and, and I'll tell you, it's going to be something to see because this is as tall as those Saturn V rockets where I'm, I'm playing back this great animation that NASA has uh, just to kind of give everyone an idea of what we're talking about today. So the test that you went to uh, is for that booster rocket that's in the frame right now. Uh, it was on the ground. I'm going to pull up now a video that you took uh, at the site of this test the other day. So what are we seeing here? It's on the ground, it's strapped down, and they lit this thing, and what did it do? Yeah, so uh, it, it's really neat. The, the this booster is about 160 feet long, uh, and because it weighs so much, it kind of it kind of sags in the middle. But when they when they have it strapped to the ground, uh, they have it fully instrumented. Uh, it's it's got a, a load cell bank on the front of it that can take the full three and a half million pounds of thrust. And when they light it up, they they're measuring pressures uh, and strain. They had over 530 high speed measurements going on during this test, uh, measuring everything imaginable throughout the the, death, the the burn and and as you can see there I mean it produces a tremendous amount of fire and smoke uh, and the, the the heat from this is is so great that the sand and the dirt from the from the ground actually becomes uh, glass siliconized uh, as the as the heat melts it uh, it's it's a spectacular thing to see wow and as, and as someone you designed solid rocket uh, motors yourself what is <laughs> where is this on the scale of what you do uh, uh, this is this is mecca i mean this is crazy uh you, you, it doesn't get any bigger or better than this so uh you know the the the, the amazing thing to me though is uh the day before the test they took us around the facility and they showed us how they uh, cast the grains, how they mix the propellant, and there's a striking similarity to the way that 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 I process my propellant uh, as an amateur. So it was really gratifying to see, to see that that the 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 tie, but also very very interesting to see the scale at which they're doing it. The, they mix propellant uh, in uh, mixing bowls that contain about 6,800 pounds of propellant per bowl, and they process 44 bowls for each segment of grain and then there's five of these segments uh, that make up the entire rocket motor so uh, and then and then as they do it they call it a campaign while they're doing the mixing and they'll they only have 16 bowls so as they're using the bowls they'll mix propellant send it over to be cast in the into the grain once it's cast in the grain those bowls will go back be cleaned and reprocessed and reused immediately and they'll keep doing that and it takes about 24 hours for them to actually cast one segment of grain and what does this fuel look like is it is it like it's solid is it can you, is it like rock solid is it like a goo what, what is it yeah, it's it's kind of like a, a sandy mud so it's uh, it's very thick uh, but they heat it they have liquid uh, jackets around the mixing bowls and they heat the propellant up to i think it was a, about 140 degrees fahrenheit uh, to make it very liquidy uh, so it's, it's, it's just like a thick sludgy kind of mess. Uh, it's very sticky. It's kind of a, uh, rust brown color. They use red iron oxide, which is actually just, uh, fine particles of rust. And that's a burn rate catalyst that they use uh, wow. in the propellant. So it's, it, it's neat. And then they process everything under vacuum so that there's no voids and they do a lot of, uh, extreme amounts of quality control to make sure that, uh, everything is done right. They, they take and, and cast sample. Uh, motors from each bowl and samples uh, pieces of propellant and make sure that every stint and and works the same every time. So I'm going to pull up now the image that you took with the GoPro that we sacrificed for this mission here. <laughs> so, <laughs> so this GoPro yeah. is like right next. How close is the GoPro to the rocket the, that we're watching? The right GoPro now? is actually about 25 feet away from the nozzle exit. And uh, 25 feet. And, so that's not very far. 20, 25 feet. No, the, the motor itself is 12 feet in diameter. So this was extremely close. Uh, it, was, it was a really neat opportunity. They, they had allowed us to place remote cameras, uh, but the morning of the test, we got to go up there at 5 o'clock in the morning, uh, and I was able to, to, to work my way over to meeting with the test director, uh, and he gave me the all clear to place this camera extremely close, uh, knowing that it was a high-risk situ situation. And, uh, and in the end, it... Uh, it, it took a beating. <laughs> <laughs> it did take a beating. So you have the uh, you have the GoPro in question with you at the moment, right? Uh, yeah, actually. Oh, okay. Or I can, can pull I, it up. I have a video here. Okay, I'm gonna, you got it there? I, this might even pull be more up, fun to look at. So we're going to let this around, video yeah. play through. It gets blurrier and blurrier. And the reason why it's getting blurry is because the GoPro is melting, <laughs> right? So uh, Yeah, so, so, the, so the, the radiant heat energy coming off this flame was, you know, tremendous. Uh, and, and eventually the, the casing from the GoPro succumbed to the heat. And uh, and it shut down. And thankfully, the care the files were not corrupted, and uh, and the memory card stayed intact. So so the we memory were able to card survived. 
and we're looking at this melted mess right here. It almost looks like that waterproof casing saved the internal camera from, from more damn. Well, it, I guess the camera's dead, but it, it, it lasted as long as it did probably because of that casing, right? <laughs> yeah, it, it definitely helped. It's, it, it's definitely dead. <laughs> wow. It's neat. If you, if, you, if you see in that video down near where the black mount is, you yep. can see the button from the front of the GoPro case has kind of melted and sagged all the way down to, wow. to the ground, if you will. So, so this is 25 feet away. What would, what would you estimate the temperature to be to do that kind of, uh, if you had to guess? Oh, I don't know, four, four or five hundred degrees probably. Yeah, so it's really, really yeah. cooked it. <laughs> at, at least, at least. You could, you could roast marshmallows just fine. Wow, that was something. So now did you, did you, you probably expected this to happen, right? That the GoPro would totally... You know, fine. I knew it would take a little heat damage. Uh, I, I had a little experience with melting GoPros in my past. So uh, in... <laughs> In my Quake rocket, I had a GoPro that was right up against the skin of the rocket, and uh, that that uh, suffered some frictional air heating because it was Mach going Mach three, and and one of those cameras uh, got partially melted and destroyed from from that. So I kind of predicted that it might happen, but it was worth it. It was worth it. And one thing I'm watching here as the um, as the as the rocket's going off here is that the the motor seems to be gimbling at the at the bottom of it. So that's to steer the rocket. Is that what that's for? Yeah. So uh, that's, that's part of the thrust vector control system, and that was one of the main things that they were trying to test uh, in this that was different from, they'd done some development motor tests. Uh, it, uh, it gimbals the motor, I think about plus or minus six degrees uh, in both, both axes, and that's part of the stabilization system that helps guide the rocket, and then also uh, if you see when the when the shuttle rolls, that's by by tilting the two uh, nozzles in opposite directions. That's what creates a, a roll. And uh, Gambit Rocks in our chat room was asking if this uh, new, new rocket design is, is it any safer than the old ones, or is it still pretty much as risky as the old ones were? Uh, that's an excellent question. Uh, I would, I, I think there's probably some risk reduction uh, because of a slightly simpler system. I think there was a lot of complication associated with the the shuttle orbiter. Uh, and the interfaces there and the plumbing that had to take place and, and, the, and the recovery style. So I think in the end, this will probably be a safer system. And uh, Eric Chug also in the chat room is asking, um, how much fuel per second can you estimate it uses? So it was using, uh, I, I think it was about five to 6,000 pounds, two and a half tons per second. Two and a half tons so, per second. Yeah. That is Unbelievable. <laughs> so when you're designing a rocket, you have to think about what it weighs at different points of the flight, I guess, because it will weigh a lot less burning two and a half tons per second uh, than when it first takes off, right? Yeah, absolutely. And it's, it's, it's a really neat thing. Uh, one of the things that, that came up was the connection of these solid rocket boosters to the core, whether it be in the shuttle or in the SLS. There's a, a skirt on the forward end of the motor that's uh, actually a, a cast aluminum piece that's been highly machined that transmits the load from the forward end of the uh, booster into the core. And, and it's, uh, it's just a large uh, cylinder with a, a tongue sticking out one side. And that tongue, about, it's only about eight inches across, uh, away from the, from the in, in radius and then maybe a foot wide. So it's a very small footprint. And that's where all of the load is being transferred. And uh, even though these boosters produce three and a half million pounds of thrust at peak, that uh, thrust load bearing system was only had to be proof tested to two and a half million pounds of thrust because the booster itself weighs a million pounds. So uh, <laughs> how do you keep this thing from flying off the, I mean, I, I don't understand how it's not even moving um, with this. And this is full blast here, right? So this is, <laughs> this could get something into space and how come yeah. it's not moving? So what, what do you, yeah, how do so, they prevent So what that? they, they have a block there that, the forward thrust bearing block is uh, it's kind of a concrete iceberg. It's uh, 20 foot uh, uh, wide, 40 foot long, and 15 feet tall. That's the exposed portion of the poured concrete. Underneath the ground, there's a 60 foot wide, 100 foot long, 14 foot thick slab of concrete. Uh, and that's made out of 3,300 cubic yards of concrete weighing over 11 million pounds. So it's and that's how they keep that? it in place. So it's pressing against that. Yeah, so it's pushing against that, and that's what that's what bears the load. Wow, that is something. That takes a lot of engineering just to figure that part out. Yeah, yeah. And so what it's we see, and what we're seeing here is pretty much the full rocket as it's as it's being. This is the one that's eventually going to go up. Is that right? Yep. Yeah. That's this is uh, the, 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 these are considered qualification motors. So these are as 
intended to be flown. So there shouldn't be any changes between what they're testing now and what they're flying. The, the, there's going to be two of these qualification motors, uh, and they're going to be running at two different temperatures streams. So this was what they considered the hot fire test. So they had preheated the entire propellant uh, mass to uh, 90 degree average bulk temperature. Uh, and that way, uh, the, one of the things about solids is that uh, the temperature of the propellant changes slightly the burn rate. And the higher the burn rate, the greater the thrust, but also the greater the pressure. And so the, 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 the casing has to withhold that greater thrust. The next Qualification motor QM2 will be at the low temperature, though. so they'll chill it and keep it at uh, 60 degrees, and then that'll deter that'll that'll bracket the window around which they'll have ability to fly within those, that temperature range from 60 to 90. And speaking of temperature, Eric Chung in our ta uh, chat room here, Chug, sorry, uh, asked the same another question, actually a good one. Uh, what do they use for metal at the end so the whole thing doesn't melt? Because if it melts your GoPro 25 feet away, I would imagine the temperatures there would melt a lot of metal. So what what do they put? What kind of materials are they using to prevent that from happening? Yeah, the, the casings themselves are made out of D6 steel, uh, but they're lined with uh, an EPDM rubber, and it's a really neat process. This was one of my, my big, big questions, was how do they apply the liner? And uh, the liner is actually made out of sheets of rubber that they, they have scaffolds. They lay, the, lay these segments uh, horizontally on the ground, and, and people climb inside of them and lay these sheets of rubber, and it's partially cured rubber. And they'll just do butt joints where they'll bring, as they lay the sheets in, the two sheets will just be pulled up against each other, and then... They'll vacuum bag that and put it in the oven, and that'll do the secondary curing, and those, those sheets of rubber will melt and join to each other. And then they'll x-ray that and make sure that they have a continuity of the liner. And by doing that with different sheets, they can structure where they want those seams to be and then also what the different thicknesses are. So if anybody's familiar with solid rocket motors, these are sort of like Bates grains. So they have a cylindrical core, but they have ex partially exposed ends so that as the core uh, grows, the grain also shortens and that balances it out and keeps the surface area approximately even throughout the burn. So you're saying that they put rubber in there to prevent the, the metal from, from melting? Yeah, so what the kind rubber, of rubber protects it. And, <laughs> and it it's EPDM rubber and mm -hmm. actually rubber is actually a great material for it because it's, it's ablative. So as it oh, burns, so the rubber, it creates rubber, a char level I layer see. and then that char layer protects it and then also gets eroded away slowly. So, so that the high heat rubber that's being ablated away is what prevents so it's very similar yeah. to a heat shield on a rocket which which ablates also right when they're coming back exactly on a capsule or exactly something. so exactly very, very the same cool. process and then the nozzle is made out of carbon carbon or graphite graphite whatever, you know, however you want to call it but it's a it's a special graphite like material that's reinforced and uh, extremely expensive and hard to process but can withstand those high temperatures. So now this was a big test for NASA, and I, I guess they're still probably looking at all the data, but I would imagine that uh, this, this seemed to be successful and that nothing exploded and it, and it burned its <laughs> full length out. Um, so what, what does this mean for the, the program? I guess this was a successful test for, for the this was, a, this was This was a successful test. They, uh, they reported uh, from, the, from the quick look data that they got to see immediately following the test that everything looked nominal and, and had gone as planned. Uh, so yeah, I, I think I think the probability of a, of, a, of a catastrophic failure was extremely low in this case. Uh, I think uh, you know they want to probably see how well their predictions match what, what actually happened, and that'll in the end ultimately determine the success of this test. But uh, from from everything they could gather initially, it was a successful test. And this is great. So uh, you know the, uh, the the video is just remarkable. I think the the GoPro being as close as it was, you can just see just how much power is getting pushed out of that rocket right when it. Uh, Right when it lights up, it's yeah. Every, everything you can see, everything on the ground, and that that post that's just in the front left of the frame there had a piece of uh, dark tape around it, and, and it's it's absorbing so much radiant heat that it's just everything is smoking and, and burning, just from being nearby. It's amazing. It really is just incredible. So now I want to talk about before we. Uh, wrap up. Um, you do some other stuff <laughs> with rockets as well. Um, you call yourself a hobbyist, but the kind, of, the kind of hobby that you have here is just remarkable. So um, I'm going to play some video here of uh, the Black Dragon that I pulled off your website or off your YouTube okay. channel. So um, this thing is enormous. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a huge rocket. Um, how, how high have you got something like almost to the edge of space or to space? Yeah, so so uh, the Black Dragon is kind of an extreme end of hobby style rocketry, which is a really large rocket with a smaller motor in it. So that was an 18 inch diameter, 26 foot tall rocket that weighed 300 pounds. And by the way, small uh, motor one, here. We're watching four guys put it in. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a small motor, right? Um, that 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 rocket went about 13,000 feet uh, and just barely supersonic, which is really good for a, for a rocket that size, um, but but not really the kind of the high altitude stuff. Uh, some of the other stuff that we've done, like with Quake and with uh, CSXD GoFast, are more 
missile-like almost, and those are really high-performance rockets where you're really pushing to have the the most amount of mass fraction and, and, and performance that you can get out of them. Uh, and in those cases, you know, uh, Quake ended up going 121,000 feet, and GoFast went uh, 72 miles, so about 380,000 feet. Uh, so those are the those are kind of the extreme limits of the high end of the hop. Wow. And so I have another video here. That, this is the Carmack launch attempt here. I'm going to play back a launch of one of your rockets here. So um, this yeah, one looks that, like... That's, a, that's Quake. That's Quake. Yeah. And this was... So John Carmack, the guy that created Quake, is also trying to get... Uh, he's trying to compete in the commercial space arena. So he had a contest here, right, to see who can get... Uh, it was the yeah, goal so, was to get to space, right? Well, no, the, the, the thing about it was is with a lot of people that, uh, that, that get on forums and in other uh, public air arenas and talk about how easy it is okay. to to build to build things to go to space and and a lot of it's talk and uh, and basically John Carmack called their bluff and said hey if, if you guys think it's that easy I got ten thousand dollars that says uh, you guys can't put a you know to whoever can put a, a rocket to a hundred thousand feet and get GPS data and uh, and bring it back successfully and uh, and I said, well, that sounds like something I might be able to do. So uh, that's what Quake was about, was trying to, to meet those goals. Uh, okay. In the end, I got the 100,000 feet, went 121,000 feet, fully recovered, but didn't get any GPS data. It turned out that that was actually a little trickier than uh, expected. Even though we had a bunch of GPS, four GPS units on there, uh, they all lost lock at, uh, during the acceleration of a boost. Uh, oh, so after all that work, you, you didn't get the money, huh? Uh, he get, he ended up he ended up granting me half the prize. Okay, uh, well, that's which good. was nice. It that was, was a, fair. A, a that was good, fair. A good concession. Yeah. Yeah. I, I was happy with it. So we're watching this rocket take off right now. You had a bunch of cameras on it. I, it, it. I guess you could say it goes off like a rocket. There's really there's no delay between the time that motor lights and this thing is off the pad and flying. So uh, there's not a lot of weight on these rockets beyond the engine, I would imagine, right? Right. So uh, in a, in a rocket like Quake, you got four thousand pounds of thrust behind a vehicle that weighs uh, two or three hundred pounds. So you you get a lot of acceleration off the pad uh, and so a lot more than a human could ever stand so it's very it's, it's much more missile like than it is space launch vehicle like it did have some payload that were watching this GoPro footage of, of uh, or whatever you, you strapped the camera to the side of it that's amazing I put a little FDM printed uh, 3d shield over it shroud there walked over it to protect the, the GoPro the lens was down looking and I'd print them the friction of the air passing over it when it was going Mach 3 actually melted the plastic, and that's what you can see in the in the frame uh, when you see plastic going by and a little something blocking the view. That's what that is. Wow! And uh, what? So the camera that was on this, I think you brought, you you lost we lost your signal for a second there. Uh, what was the camera that was on the on board? That was uh, something somebody's asking. Yeah. So those there was uh, two GoPros mm -hmm. and one flip. And flip the cam. one one GoPro melted, so uh, we actually lost the video out of that. But uh, the down looking GoPro. Uh, got us some good video, and the flip got some good side-looking video. So, oh, so the side image we're watching right now is from a flip uh, flip camera. Yeah, those are almost disposable at this point because <laughs> they're gone. Yeah, right? nowadays, nowadays those are. Uh... I have four of them. I'll send you one for the next. Uh... <laughs> I have so many flip cameras from a from a prior project. That's pretty amazing. So, now when these these come back down on parachutes, or they just kind of crash. So, uh, in that case, a lot of times in the in the hobby, people will use uh, electronics that measure acceleration or peak altitude uh, to determine when to. To do to, to fire off the parachutes. In my case, I used simulation, and I just used it based on time, uh, because when you're in a flight like that, it takes so long to reach apogee. Uh, you know, the, the motor will burn for 10 seconds or less, uh, but it'll take 90 seconds to reach apogee. So for 80 seconds, you're coasting vertically, if you will. Uh, and so any anywhere near the end of that, you can pop out the parachute. And actually, because you're so far above the atmosphere, at that point you're above 99% of the atmosphere, there's really nothing to slow it down. So even when the parachute comes out, that vehicle was going supersonic on its way back in because it was just no air to slow it down. Wow, that's amazing. What does it cost to do this? This is, this is an expensive uh, hobby, I would imagine. <laughs> yeah, too much. <laughs> uh, uh, in, in this case, I was really fortunate because uh, my company was very supportive. So they, uh, they, they offered all the machining services. So all I had to pay for was materials. But, uh, and, 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 the, and I had already, already had all the chemicals available. And so it was built on a lifetime of, of rocketry. So even though it was done uh, relatively quickly and, and inexpensively it, it, it was based on a, on a lot of other other work previous work 
And so this is not something you can do like every weekend, I would imagine. This takes time to, to plan this out. You have to, you have to make the, the motor with the rocket fuel, right? I mean, there's things that you have to do to make these things work. So uh, it, it must kill you not to be able to do this like every day of the week. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm actually slower than NASA. I'm, uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm doing about one rocket every four years now, which is uh, pretty slow. It really, it takes maybe a year worth of uh, planning and design, and then execution can be anywhere from, you know, three to six months to actually do it once, you, once you're once you ready. Wow, and behind you it looks like that is the rocket that we were just watching, the Quake. Right? Yep, that, that's Quake right there. And were you the only one competing at that, that, that competition or were there other people also? No, there was, there was actually uh, that launch uh, that I was at with a smaller two-stage rocket. Uh, you can, you can, your efficiency goes way up when you stage because you get to lose a lot of the excess weight early on. Uh, they didn't quite make it on that attempt, but uh, on a subsequent attempt, they actually met all of John Carmack's requirements and were granted the the full prize. Wow, that's remarkable! Really, yeah, so it's pretty. It's 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 not uncommon now for amateurs with two stage rockets to be able to hit 100,000 feet. Holy mackerel! Now are there, there must be events that happen. Is there a website people can go to? Because uh, Eric, Eric in the chat room is like he's hooked now. He's into this, so he he wants to uh, <laughs> uh, he wants to yeah. go and see this himself. So so is there a place so, where we can go and um, you know find some events? Is there like a clearinghouse for this kind of thing? Yep, yep. Uh, Tripoli Tripoli Rocketry Association T R I P O L I dot org is uh, the main high power rocketry club uh, in the country. Uh, it's a na it's a national club. They've got chapters uh, in you know, every every sector or every region of the country that uh, have organized launches, get FAA clearances, and they can really help you uh, get get started in the hobby and work your way through uh, the process. Wow, that's really something. Really cool stuff. So, uh, Derek, where can people find all that you do? I have your uh, your, your your address here linked in the uh, the, the uh, on your title screen here. You don't see it, but uh, ddeville.com. Is there other places that people can go to find? You have a YouTube channel too, right? You have a YouTube channel. D three Deville uh, is the YouTube channel. Uh, and then, if you're just looking for generic information about model rocketry or high power rocketry, flyrockets.com is a uh, is another interesting site that that helps connect people to uh, to the hobby. And what's the, I guess the best way to get started is how everyone has gotten started, I guess, with SD's rockets, right? Some, something small and uh, relatively uh, low damage causing uh, devices. <laughs> yeah, that's the, that's the entry point. Most of the people who are, are involved in high power rocketry and amateur rocketry these days consider themselves born again rocketeers. So they started out with SD's as kids and they all remember and they all, it seems to be a trend that they all did the same kind of thing. You know, oh, the, the, the kit said put an A motor in it. So you put a D in it, you know, and uh, the kid the kids said, make it a two-stage, and he made it a three. Uh, it's a pretty common story. Um, so if that if that's you and you fit that profile, get into high-power rocketry. It's a, it's a great thing. There's also a magazine called Rockets Magazine. Uh, you can look them up. I don't know what their their address is, but they're, it's a great magazine that, that covers all the national launches and has lots of vendor uh, advertisements, and it'll get you started. And where do you see the hobby going? Because now they're hitting space now. I mean, that's something that wasn't hobbyists weren't doing before, what, 2004, 2006 or so. Uh, where's the hobby going? I mean, is, are, is there anyone crazy enough to maybe try to put themselves in one of their own rockets? Is that is that <laughs> far off there or what? <laughs> well, I hope no one does. Uh, you know, that's it, it's a great question to see where, where things are going. Um, technology is making a big difference. We're seeing a lot of 3D printing coming into the hobby now, people be, getting creative with that. Um, uh, I think more. I, I like to see more and more people get into the propulsion side of things. That's the that's the the, the real science. Uh, that's much more interesting to me is figuring out the chemistry and the and the physics and the mechanics of of making your own propulsion. Um, but the electronics are a big a big arena now. People are getting much more serious with the GPSs and the inertial nav and the the the, the electronics packages that they put together in these rockets now. So that's kind of a a neat frontier now. Yeah, and, that's, and I, I would guess too that with the Raspberry Pis getting more powerful, and there's all sorts of other little tiny little computers that can that can really process a lot of data for a very little footprint, both in power and overall size. That's pretty. That's got to be exciting in, in a new direction, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you, 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 your average smartphone today is kind of the the perfect all-in-one rocket computer. I mean, you've got. Uh, you know, smarts. You got a six-axis uh, or, or, or uh, three-axis uh, accelerometers and gyros and cameras, and it's all there, ready to go. So I mean, you, you stick an iPhone or a, a Galaxy in a, in a rocket, and I think you're ready to go. 
Unbelievable. Der Derek, thank you so much for joining us. This was a really, uh, it was cool just to see that, that video you brought back from Utah, but to see everything else that you do, I think is really something. And everyone in the uh, chat room got a great, uh, a great time here. I've been getting a lot of good comments here and uh, a bunch of people subscribed already. So you'll have a few new subscribers on the channel and a few of your videos have done pretty well. So uh, you'll get a few more views on those and everybody around you and stuff. It's really neat. So, well, Derek, thanks again for joining us so late at night here. And uh, uh, really, uh, it was a real pleasure talking to you. A lot of people really love seeing the footage and uh, check Check out his, uh, his webpage and uh, his YouTube channel because he's got a lot more stuff for you to see. And if you're into high-powered rocketry, definitely uh, hit him up because I'm sure he can get you uh, directed to the right place to uh, uh, safely uh, launch stuff off the ground very quickly. So, uh, and, and feel free to contact me directly with, the, with email also. Oh, great. Excellent. So reach out to him direct. He's happy to hear from you. And thank you all for watching. We'll be back with some more interviews soon. And this is Lon Seidman. Thanks for watching.